It began as a political debate at the highest levels in Washington. I believe that the industry knew it had a problem that needed to be addressed. I hope you walk away with one thought today, that if you don't do something about it, we will. Members of Congress talking about uh, video games being the sort of the decline and fall of Western civilization and destroying our youth and leading them down the path of the no good. And brought the game industry together. We began sort of in a crisis, in a reactive way. They changed minds. They know that if they go too far, there is a regulating body that's going to say, hold it. That's a little bit too much for the audience that you're shooting for and the way we look at games. You gotta know what games are right for you. The industry takes the ESRB very, very seriously. This is how the Entertainment Software Ratings Board Check the rating. Or the ESRB was created. When you check the rating, the control's in your hand. Why not? Well, do you think they can handle it? Of course they can. What could possibly go wrong? What are you doing now? Video games have a history of controversy. No! Early explicit games like Gotcha released by Atari, push the envelope. You know, it was, we were, we were young and dumb and uh, trying to figure things out. And um, everyone was talking about the phallic nature of joysticks. And so we thought, well, maybe it would be good to have two big pink rubber controllers on the face of the game in which you were manipulating breasts. So we had these sort of breast-shaped controllers and grabbed the public's attention. It was uh, really one of the first pornographic games. It had a certain lure of appeal that some people went for and some people didn't. The game was a total failure. <laughs> and I don't know if it was a game or whether it was the controllers, but the whole thing didn't work. More games follow, like Death Race in 1976, released by Exidy. The game draws such public outcry for its violence PTA mother Ronnie Lamb proposes regulation on arcades. Kind of the center of this was Ronnie Lamb from Babylon, New York. She appeared on, on the Donahue show, and she was just everywhere uh, attacking video games. And she, and she was very vocal. She did lead a lot of people. Like in Texas, there were, there were big court cases where, they, where arcades were limited in the hours they could open and, and where they could be located. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, where justices declined to rule on its constitutionality. And the game industry marches on. The growth of the industry, I think, is really one of the great stories of the 90s. Ten years ago with this industry, it was mostly about adolescent boys. And what's happened is the Nintendo generation grew up. The video game industry has certainly evolved significantly over the last couple of decades. Graphic capabilities have advanced. Gameplay has advanced. Lots more different types of content elements have been introduced. In the 1992 arcade game Mortal Kombat, those elements included violently infamous finishing moves. That was one of the first uh, really controversially violent games because it had the fatalities uh, where you would finish him and then the, the head would fly off and the brains would fly over and spine would go someplace. So people were really crazy about that game at the time. It was a fun game. It was, it was interesting. Um, I think the, the rating system was an evolution at that point, so it's interesting when you look at some of the content that's in mainstream media 
and you compare it to the content that's in games. And in many cases, uh, what you can see on the primetime news is as violent or even more violent in many cases than what you'll, you'll get in media such as video games or movies. Liu Kang wins. And it gets Washington's attention. I think there was a growing concern about violence in some of the games. Mortal Kombat. And Doom that were getting attention at that point in time. So it was a growing, uh, a growing concern about violence in video games. How would the industry react? Five teenage girls have disappeared. Your mission? Protect those girls. <laughs> the brains or the guts for this assignment. Give the controls to someone who does. As the game industry matures, so does its target audience. Titles such as and Mortal Kombat are designed to appeal to a different audience. But not all companies take this route. When Mortal Kombat is released on home consoles, Nintendo only allows a less violent, bloodless version of the 2D fighter to be ported to the Super Nintendo. Violent video games. Back then, it was the very first Mortal Kombat game, and a game that um, didn't really have a lot of commercial success but got a lot of attention a game called Night Trap. Your parents are gone, so come on, Sarah, what's the first thing you think of? Party! I, th I think the best one would be a Night Trap for the Sega CD, which has the distinction of being a bad direct to video B horror movie as a game. <laughs> Star Dana Plato. We're going in. It had decent production value. A lot of weird-looking dudes around here. It's akin to watching like one of the sleepaway camp movies. You know, it's not Friday the 13th, it's not Nightmare on Elm Street, but they're really trying hard. <laughs> you know, to give you something compelling. While gamers and critics alike pan titles such as Night Trap, the violent and racy games ignite a firestorm in Washington, spearheaded by Democratic Senator Joe Lieberman. And the game industry responds. The IDSA formed back in late 93, early 1994. The Interactive Digital Software Association is a trade association. We are the voice of the video and computer game industry on public policy issues in Washington at the state level. The pivotal event that triggered the formation of the organization was the very first uh, wave of criticism from Senator Joe Lieberman and Senator Herb Cole of violent video games. I believe that the industry uh, knew it had a problem that needed to be addressed. There was concern about these games. Why do you need to uh, go across that line and produce this stuff for adults or, or kids? Members of Congress talking about uh, video games being the sort of the decline and fall of Western civilization and destroying our youth, leading them down the path of the no good. And the industry felt that uh, we needed to respond in some way, in a proactive way. Senator Lieberman was talking about introducing, and in fact did introduce legislation, to create a federal rating system for video games. And we felt that it was much more productive for the industry to self-regulate. There were congressional hearings in the early 90s that took a serious look at the video game industry and wanted to make sure that the video game industry was acting responsibly. While on his warpath against violence in gaming, Senator Lieberman focuses on Mortal Kombat and Night Trap as offending examples. Adding to the controversy, the game industry faces its own internal strife over the conflict. As an uncensored version of Mortal Kombat is released on the Genesis console, rumors surface about Nintendo spurring the debate on violent games to hinder Sega's success. Tensions peak in 1993 when Washington gives the game industry an ultimatum. They must get their act together and agree on a rating system within one year or else. I hope you walk away with one thought today that if you don't do something about it, we will. In 1994, the Recreational Software Advisory Council, RSAC, is formed and develops a content-based rating system. The RSAC one was actually really good because it was an objective set of questions that you, you went through. Anybody, you could, you could take a game like Doom and go through the questions and get the same rating. Doom was one of the first products to come out and subjected itself to the RSAC. That's good information to pass around. But it didn't make it because it wasn't quite movie-ish. It wasn't quite like the movies. Meanwhile, the IDSA gets to work on its own rating system. We felt it was much more productive for the industry to self-regulate rather than face uh, federal ratings. 
which not only do I think would have been unconstitutional, but they certainly would have been, um, I think, quite problematic. So the industry came together, united, and said, how do we act responsibly to respond to this concern? The industry recognized it had a responsibility to parents and to our consumers as we got bigger. And we had a responsibility to tell people what was in our product and to help them make informed decisions. And out of the IDSA, the ESRB, a self-regulating rating system, is born. The sense was to create this trade association that would be able to represent the industry on policy issues. And the first act was to create a rating system, now known as the Entertainment Software Rating Board. The rating system is based on the motion picture industry's rating system, but is more detailed. What the ASRB is responsible for is um, much like the movie industry, where you, the movie's rated R or PG-13 or G for everyone, or NC-17. They perform the same function for uh, video games. Actually, the Federal Trade Commission has, has kind of lauded our, our industry's rating system as the most thorough and the most comprehensive. The ESRB has certainly given the industry a really good set of guidelines to follow, and everyone follows them. There's no game release without ESRB rating. It helps clearly define what the uh, target audience is for the game. Shortly after its introduction in 1994, game developers and publishers quickly adopt the ESRB rating system. The industry takes the ESRB very, very seriously. You know, it's a responsibility not only of developers and publishers, but it's a responsibility of everyone to make sure you know what audience the game is intended for. It's up to developers, it's up to publishers, it's up to parents. But how does the ESRB work? A publisher has a product that isn't completely finished yet, but close enough so they can assemble submission materials that include a videotape of all of the most extreme content in the game, as well as the context, the storyline, the characters, the setup, any introductory sequences, anything that would give us an indication as to the content elements in the game and the age appropriateness. We have a very uh, thorough written submission form that every publisher has to fill out and write what is actually in the game, what's depicted, what's said, any dialogue, any depiction whatsoever that could be relevant in terms of a content rating. And a, a ratings board, three people, will then view this tape, read the documentation that goes along with it, but they don't play the game necessarily. Within a week, uh, have independent raters come in, look at the video, and based on the consensus... We'll decide on what the rating of this game should be. We apply a rating along with content descriptors and the publisher gets their rating certificate. It usually takes about five to seven business days. The key to a good rating system is a diverse collection of people rating the games. Our rating system was fundamentally premised on having ordinary Americans come in and rate games. Don't have to be a gamer. Male, female, cultural backgrounds have to be diverse, marital status. It would be helpful uh, and in fact, we look for raiders who have had some kind of exposure to kids. But the bottom line is, is we want ordinary Americans to be looking at this content using their own judgment, their own cultural backgrounds, their own tastes, what is appropriate for which ages and which content needs to be called out to a consumer on a box or in an app. So it's American public uh, opinion. It's not the industry's opinion. But has the ESRB gone far enough? I think it does a good job. I think it could do a better job on certain things. It's time for a, a PG-13 type of rating in the gaming world. With a self-regulated rating system in place, some developers feel free to push the boundaries. In 1996, Harvester is released by Merit Studios. The company claims it is the most violent video game ever released. But not all game publishers are interested in pushing the envelope. Electronic Arts decides not to release an ultra-violent fighting game called Thrill Kill. But the ESRB isn't enough for some. In June of 1999, Senators John McCain and Joe Lieberman passed the Media Violence Labeling Act. We had two different violence descriptors, mild violence and violence. We felt that consumers could use a little bit more nuance, a little bit more information in terms of what kind of violence. The new act calls for more detailed descriptions in the ratings, unlike the MPAA system for films. The video game ratings are quite different um, in some key respects from the movie ratings. First of all, video games are a different medium. 
A video game is interactive, a film is passive. Video games, as realistic as they're getting, are still predominantly animation. Realistic looking, yet quite different visually than a film. So the whole experience is different, and we felt from the very beginning that we couldn't simply graft on the motion picture rating system. But even with the new additions, there is still room for improvement in the ESRB system. Now, what I think would be a perfect thing for the ESRB to do, and one thing that I have sort of advocated in my column, is that it's time for a, a PG-13 type of rating in the gaming world. You know, we've got E. E equals G, T equals PG, and M equals R. That's fine, that helps to a point. But if you have something that's sort of a middle ground between T and M, then you can have these games that sort of walk the line between the two and still have the M rating carry a little bit more weight. And the ESRB continues to evolve. In 2003, the ESRB conducted an extensive review of the rating system. We talked to child development experts, we talked to consumer advocacy groups, we talked to members of the academic community, uh, we talked to consumers, we talked to as many people as we could to understand how successful the rating system is and where are the areas that we could make improvements. We introduced a number of significant changes to the rating system. By 2003, a new set of improvements to the rating system is announced. Boxes get bolder labels reflecting their ratings, descriptions of game content become more precise, and distinctions between different types of violence are used. First was we wanted to make sure that the mature rating symbol was clear in terms of its age appropriateness. So we added 17 plus to the actual rating symbol. So if a consumer picks up a box, they don't have to guess what the age range is for a mature rating. The second change we made was we wanted to make sure that consumers didn't miss the content descriptors on the back of every package. Short phrases that describe the content in the game. Critical, critical piece of the rating system. And the game developers themselves are kept informed of ratings guidelines. All those guidelines are really, really good for our industry, you know, because they make it clear what really is an e-game. What is a T-game? What is an M game? I applaud the ASRB for, for enforcing these uniformly. In 2003, the IDSA undergoes a transformation of its own, changing its name to the ESA. ESA stands for Entertainment Software Association, and it's made up of uh, the top publishers that are based here in the US. The thing that they're probably most known for is owning and running the E3 trade show. They're an important group. They're responsible for the SRB. They also have a lot to do with talking to politicians in Washington who, you know, may or may not understand video games. It's a voluntary system. It's up to a publisher if they want to submit a product to us to be rated. It's self-regulating. I think it's very, very important. The reality is, is that it's been a universally adopted system and that the publishers have all really responded in wanting to provide this objective, independent information on the front and back of every game box and also in all of their advertising. With the ESRB rating system in place, Senator Lieberman, one of gaming's most vocal critics, has applauded the industry's proactiveness. This video game rating system is the most comprehensive an informative rating system of any entertainment uh, medium anywhere. The rating system has been praised by folks like Joe Lieberman and others as the best rating system among all entertainment industries. So it was critical that people didn't miss it. We began sort of in a crisis in a reactive way as a trade association responding to this sort of a congressional criticism, and in a very perverse way, it, it, it did us a favor. Because it allowed the industry to come together as it never had before, very competitive companies uniting together uh, around common causes. I'm very focused right now on making sure that consumers are aware of the rating system and using it. And I've even seen some ads, you know, trailers before movies. Now, I love sports. I love sports. But you got to play the game that's right for you. Same with computer and video games. ESRB uh, is, is very, very important for our industry because parents have to make sure each game is right for their kids. 
Parents need to know what they're buying for their children. How? Check the rating. Check the rating. The industry still has a ways to go to catch up to the movie ratings. We've been around for 10 years. Movie ratings have been around for 35, 40 years. Every game box has a rating symbol that suggests what age the game is best for. It's critical that consumers are aware of the rating system. And a content label that tells you what's in the game. And use it appropriately. When you check the rating, you know what to expect. The system works and gets the job done, but there's always room for improvement. I mean, I'm critical of them, and I think that there are certain things that they can do better. Given the short amount of time that they've been in existence, I think they've done a very good job getting what the ratings mean out. I think it's made developers a lot more aware of what they put in games right now. They can still push the envelope, but at the same time, they know that someone's keeping an eye on them. They know that if they go too far, there is a regulating body that's going to say, hold it. That's a little bit too much. See? You got to play the game that's right for you. 1.2 megapixel camera and holds 5,000 MP3s. Wow. That's, that's really impressive. Mm. Hold on a second. Sorry. Hello? Yeah, hey, I'm in the middle of lunch. Uh, can I call you back? All right, cool. Thanks. So that's a lot of MP3s. Yeah. See the best, greatest, biggest, shiniest, coolest, and blinkiest new stuff coming next year when the Screensavers goes live at the Consumer Electronics Show. Coming up next. Hold on, let me, let me put you on speakerphone.